Our science center, we are open seven days a week. Monday through Saturday, we are open 9.30 to 5. Sunday, we're open 1 to 5. And today, uh, we are going to be talking about kind of a, a fun group of animals. Uh, most of the animals we've talked about until now have had some sort of modern relatives. Uh, today is one of the exceptions to that. Uh, we are talking about hyenodonts. Uh, they are the other carnivores, is the way I've heard it put. Uh, it's a large group of carnivorous mammals, uh, ranging anywhere from roughly the size of a house cat at about a, a foot and a half, maybe long, to maybe 10 pounds, all the way up to being 3,300 pounds at about 10 feet long, bigger than an adult male lion. Um, hyenodonts are a group of animals from roughly 63 million years ago to 8.8 .8 million years ago. They are mammals in the order Hyenodonta, and that is kind of the best picture I can give you to what they're related to. Hyenodonta at one point was put under the classification of Creodonts. Creodonts were kind of much like Insectivora today, which is kind of where we stick animals we don't know what they're related to. Creodonts were kind of the same way. As we find a fossil of an animal, of a mammal from the... Cenozoic, we don't know what it's related to, we don't know what it's similar to. Oftentimes they would get stuck in Creodonta until we could figure it out. Um, but yeah, so hyenodonts lived in a lot of places. Uh, they evolved either in Africa or Asia, there's still some debate on that. Uh, and then migrated to North America, um, where they were quite efficient predators. And went all the way from the Paleocene to the Miocene, they were pretty much top top predator. I don't want to say top dog, because well, they weren't dogs. And hyenodonts have some physical characters. Generally, the larger ones have these in, in common, which is large heads for their body size, relatively small brains, but large nasal cavities and olfactory centers. Their sense of smell was really important to them. They had really big, tough, thick enamel teeth for getting through bone and flesh and really being efficient with what they used on their prey. They could eat quite a lot. It's theorized they could actually crush bone, potentially, which is a rare thing in nature to be able to do. Uh, they had very strong jaws, so those large heads really helped have these massive bite forces. Uh, but a cool thing about their teeth is we know how their teeth erupted. We have a lot of fossils of them at various ages uh, for the individual animals where we know that they had relatively long childhoods, or adolescence, uh, anywhere from three to four years uh, for full adult teeth to come in, which for a, a predator is quite long, meaning they may have been social, and had, or at least mom was taking care of the cubs for quite a long time. Uh, they had relatively short legs and relatively short uh, lower legs. They were likely not super fast over long distance but in a dead sprint they were probably pretty quick uh meaning they would have been very good ambush predators uh and again very large bodies they tended towards again these animals are getting up there with uh you know stuff like polar bears and stuff for size they're massive predators and they were carnivorous and they preferred habitats like mixed forests stuff where there's a patchwork of trees and open space uh, or dense forests, where they could really get in close to their prey before going and trying to grab it. Again, these animals were ambush predators, that you want cover, you want something in the way. And actually, I actually do have a little model of one that we printed here, so if you want to zoom in on, on this fella, give you a little bit of a sense of what these things kind of looked like. You can see that big head, the legs where it's long upper leg, right here at the ankle. It's very short after the ankle. Uh, very similar in a lot of ways to modern cats. Um, and around 8.8 .8 million years ago, when hyenodonts finally did go extinct, um, there was a proliferation of cats and felids in the fossil record. And it got to the point where they probably were outcompeted as far as being ambush predators went. In North America, they had lost out to animals like the bone-crushing dogs, the borophagines, uh, and in other parts of the world, before a land bridge between North America and Asia formed, cats were able to kind of squeeze them out of that ecological niche. They held on for a little bit longer in Africa, with 
one of the largest species of hyenodont, um, which was Simbacubwa, which means big lion from Africa. But they, again, they were not cats. Uh, and it was one of the large predators. It was that one sitting comfortably at 3,300 pounds, probably. Uh, this animal, uh, its jawbone was found in a museum, actually, in a, in a box full of hyena jaws. Uh, someone noticed, hey, this is um, a couple, couple times bigger than all the other jaws here, and they actually looked at it for a bit and realized it was really similar to a, some smaller hyenodon species, which they were able to do a little bit more examination and realized this is probably a hyenodon. And it was, again, relatively close to the present. Uh, or hyenodonts, as far as it goes. Uh, that that particular jawbone was, I think, only like nine million years old. So not about at eight point eight million years. Uh, but yeah, so these animals they left no living descendants. Um, there's pretty much uh, James and I were just looking. Their next nearest relative was what was it we found? Um, the outgroup from the phylogeny we were looking at, so it's hard to even really call it a close relative. Which was animal was it? It was like a sh shrews. Yeah, and shrews themselves aren't exactly they're precisely in their own taxonomic ways. Been what you were saying? Yeah, they aren't exactly precisely placed. Insectivora today is sometimes still used as a waste bin, whereas if we don't know what it's related to, we'll stick it there for the time being. Um, it rather than just not have it at all on a taxonomy chart. Uh, but the hyenodonts losing out to felines and to the bone-crushing dogs is another example of what we talked about a couple weeks ago, which is the rule of competitive exclusion. You have large-bodied ambush predators. You have a couple different types. Someone's going to do that job better than the others. And from the present, we know that felids even outcompeted the bone-crushing dogs by the time they got to North America. Um, and... Basically, no two animals in an ecosystem are typically able to do the same exact thing. You, you have to differentiate. You have to partition those niches somehow. Otherwise, someone's eventually going to either go do something else or do the job a little bit better than, than you are. Um, and overall, these animals, they don't show up in media that much. They did show up in Walking with Beasts, where they are described as being a little bit bigger than they should have been, where I think they're called being about the size of a rhino. Which I think is not entirely accurate. Um, but yeah, they're cool. I kind of wish we'd see them more in documentaries and stuff. They're interesting and worthy of study, but they are a bit confusing given the fact that we really have, we have no clue what they're related to. We don't know really what's going on with them. Um, but overall, we, I find them fascinating. They're cool looking. Um, James, do you have any questions about these? I'm just kind of wondering, like, so they're ambush predators, but were they climbers? Uh, we can tell generally they probably weren't great climbers. Just being that big kind of does at times preclude yeah. useful climbing. So do you think that's a big reason why the, the, the felids ended up outcompeting them? Because being able to get up in the trees is such an advantage? For that ambush? may have been an advantage for some of the smaller felids at first, because uh, this is when the big cats start showing up. Being able to kind of ambush from different angles might have been helpful. Also, a shift from forests to grassland was starting in some places. While grasslands didn't become super prominent across the world until about 5 million years ago, 8.8 .8 million years ago, in a lot of places there were shifts going to more open areas due to a climatic shift. And what so that does, forested habitat yeah. disappearing might have also led to the hyenodon not doing as well. I think also that massive size when you're about the size of a For polar carnivore, bear, that's tough. When you're about the size of a polar bear, it's hard to hide in an open field. Yeah, and so are cats? Are cats a lot better in, in open fields, just like stalking, kind of like slinking around, basically? Generally, yes, and that's because even if you look at the modern cats or some of the prehistoric cats we've talked about on these live streams, they're not outrageously large. Like a tiger is pretty close to the same size as the largest felid that ever lived. They're not that much smaller than the American lion. Mm -hmm. They were big, but not so big that, like, you can't hide in an open area. They weren't so big that, like, they stuck out. And in terms, um, of, an, in terms of efficiency, cats as a predator, are if you can, you know, dish out the same amount of firepower, at least, like, a similar amount as, you know... You can be overkill. Like, yeah. hyenodons may have had what we're calling overkill here, where it's a little bit too much. 
because they were what we call hyper carnivores. They got, from what we can tell, over 75% of their nutrition from meat, uh, which feline, felines are as well, hyper carnivores. So those things, even in their time, even when they were doing well, they just they still couldn't have been that many of them in an area, I, I have to imagine. For individual animals, probably not that much, but there were large animals. They had a lot of food sources available, mm -hmm. so they, they probably were able to be quite numerous. We have a lot of fossils of over them. Like a long, over like a wide area. I yeah, guess. but we do have a lot of fossils, so we do know, like, there were plenty of them around. They, they fossilized well, and they fossilized often enough where we've got, you saw how many species and stuff were in that order for Hyenodonta. Is, is it the oxygen that allows everything to get so big not, back then, or what is it? Not necessarily. Uh, sometimes uh, it tends to go in cycles of temperature on Earth, um, and so then also just... Equals... It tends to be also plants dictate a lot of it. Is there enough food for big herbivores? If there's enough food for big herbivores, well, carnivores got to get bigger. It's sort of similar to the Mesozoic where you had those massive herbivores like, you know, sauropods, um, ceratopsians, hadrosaurs. You had to be pretty big to actually be able to take advantage of this large food source. Otherwise... You're not going to be able to eat any of those things. You're stuck eating the small stuff, and there might already be predators doing that. Yeah. And there were small hyenodonts. Uh, we don't focus on them that much, but again, there were some of these that were roughly the size of a house cat, so they were taking advantage of those smaller niches. And it is something we like to, we like to go over sometimes with the yeah. fossil record, is it is biased towards larger animals. When you're big, your bones are bigger. They can handle the rigors of time a little yeah. bit better when they're fossilizing. Little bones... Stuff breaks them down quicker. Here's a general ecological question for you, just considering, because you were mentioning niche partition. Yeah. And the idea of, how do you define a niche? Can a niche be broken down to as large or as small, or do you have uh, of a, of a delineation as you want? Like, do you think it comes down to what serves your research project? A is niche, it a relative metric, or is there a more objective way to it, determine a niche? It is kind of a tough thing to define, but generally, I think the way that we've done it so far is is literally... Are these animals actually like living in the same habitat at the same time, and they're not actively driving each other to extinction? Then separate they're niches. In different niches. So it's almost like sort of a. It's a, is it process working? Process of, of elimination more than anything. Yeah, it's the competitive exclusion. Is one of them being competitively excluded? Is one of you know? And so would you say that competitive exclusion defines a niche then? It probably is one of the good factors to define niches. Are these animals directly competing? A great way to look at it is large sharks today uh we have a lot of sharks that eat large mammals today aquatic mammals stuff like seals mm -hmm. but they avoid competition by changing their behavior you have great whites who hunt during the day you have tiger sharks who hunt at night mm -hmm. those are two different niches because they're they've specialized enough where the great white's not going to be up at midnight and this is basically just kind of like a, a a you shift comes out of the law of large numbers. It's just like you have a long enough period of time. If one is even slightly better at hunting in the daytime, then it's eventually going to overtake everything else in its niche. In that specific niche. Well, it won't overtake everything in the ecosystem. Right. If it's the best at diurnal hunting of large bodied prey on the upper water column. In, that, in a specific geographic area of the ocean, it's generally going to probably exclude a lot of animals. So basically, to put that in other terms, it's like if you had three different sharks, they all hunt in the day, they all had about the same size of fish, they all hunt in the same spot, and you drop them all into this same spot, eventually and if you someone's... come back to that in a million years, only one is going to be... Eventually, someone's going to be doing something else, extinct... Or in uh, a different area. Or... Change it, yeah. Basically, niche partitioning is you change where, when, or what you eat to avoid direct competition. We have a great example of our snakes here. The hognose snake eats insects. It's not competing with those snakes that are eating mammals, reptiles, and other vertebrates. Uh, Which is, is why they get so tall. Yeah, it's eating smaller prey. And then we have stuff like um, the constrictors, like uh, red-tailed boas. Uh, they can eat in a lot of different areas. They're a generalist, so they're not super specialized for any one thing. But they're also not so bad at any one of those where if a predator who is specialized at that thing is kind of in the general area, they can just go do something else. Because that's another thing with, with uh, niche partitioning. You can be really generalized. A black bear are a great example. A black bear is a really good generalist because basically, let's say there's a more efficient 
predator in the environment with a black bear? Well, then they're going to eat more plants. Yeah. Let's say there's more herbivores out competing them for vegetation. Well, they can go eat more meat. So then they can hunt the herbivores. And let's say there's uh, daytime's a little bit hairy to be up because there's people around. Well, you can go out at night. They're very versatile. So niche partition doesn't mean you have to get more specialized. You can actually be more generalized. And it just means you have to have a mechanism in, uh, of, of compensating for competition co yeah. over your main food source. Yeah, competition and and um, exclusion and you know what resources are and are not abundant are the driving forces. If you can't win over your current food source, you're going to have to switch to something else or eat it at a different time or in a different area. Yeah, and different times of day are a big one that we tend not to talk about too much, but that's a big thing with sharks is... Well, all right, who's up, at, who's up like during the day? Who's up at dawn and dusk? Who's up in the middle of the night? Those sharks, since they're eating at different times, yeah, there's the same food source available, but great white's never going to bump into a tiger shark at a seal and be like, hey, uh, your, your shift's later. Because it's such a fitness it's, negative to, well, it's for, to, such a, to, to ever bump into each other and waste time fighting over whatever their food is. It's also they're already working at such different hours it's statistically improbable that they are going to run into each other but in like so if there was some common ancestor that's that diverged i don't remember if those two sharks are super closely related actually <laughs> yeah i'm just saying like like hypothetically right like if there were two common ancestors that that started competing over the same food source it would be very rapid that one is that one population some... would dominate the other. Generally, but remember how we went over with calicotheres? There were two different types of calicothere living in similar areas who were very different body type, but they were taking advantage of the same resource. So sometimes you can get really, really close to the to the same, but you're not quite there. Which kind of comes down to like a, a thing that if you're ever going to go into biology, you have to understand that there's like always an exception. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's always, always exceptions exception to a rule. Um... Because there's always going to be one animal that's just like, nope, totally going to just take that, throw it out the window. Like, um, oh, what's a good example of the exception? To the, I mean, hognose snakes. Uh, reptiles tend not to have differentiated teeth. Hognose snakes have three different types of teeth in their mouth. Or just like anything, like, I think it just comes down to one of the things that I like about biology as a science compared to other types of science. Um, is that it really makes it clear that everything is a human model projected over reality. The model isn't reality, it's a way to understand reality. So Yeah, it's a system of, that we apply to the world around us. Right, the idea of like species... Um, is super tough as, to like, define. Distinct, yeah, like entities, like eventually you, once you realize... Like, look at how enough population time is. Looking at animals and you realize this Coyotes, is really a, so. a pretty thin... Or a, a pretty... It can be a thin. Spectrum. It can be a very thin barrier between what we call two different species. Yeah. Um, this is getting a little bit on a different tangent, but it is a good one to go over. Like we've talked about wolves and coyotes before. Anyone who's been here is wolves can breed with coyotes and produce fertile offspring. It's not like a mule where it's not fertile. Mm -hmm. um, bobcat and lynx can produce fertile offspring. Um, the line sometimes what d separates animals from reproducing, especially so bring it back to hyena dons, there was a lot of different species of them. And they all, a lot of them coexisted with each other. There were, it was probably very similar to canines today, where there's not a lot separating individual species. It might just be a little bit of that um, being a bit too big to be considered, or being a little bit too small, or not being found in the same area, but being genetically compatible. Um, but generally, yeah, hyenodonts are a really cool animal. Hopefully we'll have a little bit more information on them uh, in, up for an upcoming thing. Um, but yeah, um, also, uh, before I go, I want to talk to you guys about uh, Prehistoric Painting Night. So we had one uh, Saturday, which went very well. Uh, and on April 22nd, which is Earth Day, which is a great little bit of sy synergistic calendar, um, we are going to have another Prehistoric Painting Night. Uh, we are working with some capstone students from Bemidji State University, and a capstone student is going to be running the next Prehistoric Painting Night. So if you want to sign up, call or email uh the same information that we had for the last one uh which i think i've got the contact stuff on, the, on, the, on an older poster here um but we have 20 spots so you're going to want to sign up when you can um the sooner you sign up the more likely we are to have a spot available um if we have open spots the day of we can accept walk-ins but those walk-ins will be limited by the number of spots still free. Thank you for tuning